Greetings all, and welcome to this afternoon's meeting. My name is Elijah. We've got exciting updates and investment opportunities on the horizon. So without further ado, let's get into it. As Kate May, we are, as Kate May, we provide prudent management of capital to deliver strong risk-adjusted returns. By way of introductions, I'm accompanied by my colleagues, Gabby, Albert, Kyle, Lily, and Josh. Just a quick agenda before we get into things. We're gonna talk about the macroeconomic environment. Macroeconomic environment. We're gonna talk about what that means in the context of our fund. We're gonna deep, deep dive into single family rental market analysis, introduce the investment opportunities before we close out. Now, I'd be remiss in a room full of real estate folks if we didn't bring this investment opportunity forward. However, we're gonna talk about this much more in depth later on in this presentation. We have the opportunity to invest in a firm called Sidewalk Advisors. They have two arms. Their prop tech arm on the left, Opco, it provides digital solutions for both asset and property management. And their property arm, Opco on the right, has given us an opportunity to invest in bundles of single family rentals. Now, just gonna briefly touch on the fund before we get into some of those macroeconomics. We are a new evergreen fund. We have target returns of nine to 11%. Founded in 2019, we are motivated to establish an accretive track record. Now, here are some of the fund objectives they're going to get the, that are going to get us to those goals that you saw in the last slide. We aim to invest. We aim to invest in opportunities that have long, positive demand tailwinds. We're leveraging short-term leases to rapidly mark to market. And lastly, we're diversifying our portfolio in terms of revenue streams and tenant profiles. Now, I'd like to introduce our resident economist, Gabby, who's gonna tell us about the market today. Gabby. Thanks, Elijah. I'd like to take a moment to address some of the greater concerns that you all have expressed to us. Now, as a long-term evergreen fund, we try to stay above that type of volatility and just surf those long-term trends to shore. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking out for rogue waves though. When looking back at 2022, one of the biggest questions everyone has is what does the return to office look like? And what is that gonna mean for residential living patterns? The industrial market is starting to see a little bit of a cool off with supply catching that tail of demand and the market reaching saturation. Amidst the fray, we feel that residential still remains a strong play as whether they're in a 40 story high rise or living in the sprawling suburbs, people still need housing. The question remains though, when to buy. At early of 2022, we did see some cap rate expansion with this, which this chart is illustrating here, adding to some price volatility as cap rates followed that seemingly unrelentless forward march of interest rates. Speaking of which, let's address the other big eye in the room, inflation. The collective millennial groan can be heard nationwide as their boomer parents hold that Thanksgiving table hostage with stories of the last time we saw inflation this high, long lines at the pump and the inevitable recession that followed. And the Fed is doing nothing to dispel those fears. Recently, they took a poll and it turns out they predict even more hawkish interest rates as at the end of 2023. Needless to say, Elijah, I think it's gonna be a long and depressing Thanksgiving dinner. All right, Gabby, I hear what you're saying, but the latest CPI report I read is actually lower than expectations by about 20 basis points to be exact. Moreover, the market is responding. As you can see on this chart here, this is a steep jump in the S&P 500 the same day those CPI numbers were released. However, in the context of the presented investments, we're inflation neutral. Our, our investment strategy is defensive and we're gonna focus on the uh, deals with solid underlying fundamentals. And lastly, we're gonna avoid unnecessary risk by focusing on moving ready assets until some of those inflation pressures cool. Now, I'd like to introduce our asset manager, Albert, who's gonna give us a rundown of what this looks like in the context of our fund. Albert? Thank you, Elijah. And so today we are now going to talk about the major fund considerations for the upcoming year. So here at Cape May, there are three pressing fund topics that we need to address <clears throat> as it relates to both debt and liquidity. The first being valuation uncertainty. You heard about the economic headwinds and we're unsure about valuations. They may decrease by five or 
Second, we need to manage down our debt and maintain a buffer to our maximum 55% loan to value ratio. And lastly, we have $200 million in subscriptions coming in. However, we need to allocate for redemptions in the coming year. We need to be defensive. And so in our analysis, we took a look at what happens if we decrease valuations by 15% in order to be conservative. This leads to $300 million in lost value, adjusting our loan to value ratio from 46 up to 53%. Like I said, we really need to be defensive during this time. Now, additionally, we also have $120 million in debt coming due next year, and both the timing and the amount are significant. To mitigate this risk, we plan to pay down $30 million of this debt in order to decrease our portfolio-wide leverage. And now you heard Gabby speak about inflation. Let's now dive into our portfolio to talk about how inflation is going to impact our different subsectors. So I'd like to orient our audience. If you see a green thumbs up, that means our team has a positive outlook when it comes to how this asset will perform in inflation. If you see a red thumbs down icon, it means the opposite. So I won't touch on all the different subsectors, but for garden and wrap apartments, rising costs are really going to be a risk to our value add strategy. We really like single family rentals because interest rates and inflation are driving home prices up, meaning this is going to be a renter's market. And lastly, we have shovel ready industrial land in our portfolio. And once again, rising costs are really going to lower our residual land values. And so ultimately we plan to use some of those land proceeds and use it for our investment into single family rentals with a target allocation of 10%. Now to recap our strategy, we plan to be defensive. We are sourcing $215 million from new LP commitments, as well as land disposition, and using those and channeling them into our three main uses, we are going to refinance our debt, we are going to provide allocation for redemptions, and also look into future investments. Now, I do want to point out that our cash balance has actually increased, meaning that we want to have a healthy uh, balance sheet for the upcoming year. Now, I would be remiss if I, if I did not speak to what happens in a recession, and luckily, we can look to the great financial crisis for lessons. As you can see on the chart behind me, multifamily values decreased by 25% post GFC. However, it took them eight quarters in order to recover and recapture this value. Multifamily is a very durable and resilient asset class for our Evergreen Fund. And we really believe that this is also going to impact single family rentals, which now I would like to introduce Lily onto the stage to dive into. Great, thank you so much, Albert. So I'm here today to speak a little bit about single family rentals. But first, a question to the audience. Is the American dream of home ownership dead? Albert, you're a millennial. Where do you live? I'm a little embarrassed to say, but in my parents' basement. <laughs> Oof. Well, what's killing Albert's dream? Well, as you can see, home prices are significantly outpacing medium household income. The average home price has increased 40% since 2018. Other factors going on include a constrained supply. The difference between demand and supply is a delta of 75,000 homes per year. We're also in an increased interest rate environment, which has driven mortgage rates to 7%, significantly compressing your payment availability. And finally, we have a generation of millennials where nearly 50% have some form of student loan. That is tax credit scores. So these macroeconomic conditions make homeownership difficult for some, but unimaginable for others. Well, good news, Albert. The American dream is reimagined with single family homes. An estimated one in five Americans live in a single family rental. I mean, just because you can't afford to buy a home doesn't mean you don't want it. I mean, dog moms want yards too. So what is SFRs or single family rentals? It's the largest growing asset class in the housing perspective. And traditionally it's been owned by single investors and mom and pops. In 2011, no single investor owned more than a thousand homes. That's changing. In 2021, Blackstone Invitation Homes, the top five of these investors owned a combined 280,000. That in today's terms is 350, but that's still only 1.5% of the saturation. So as an institutional investor, why invest in single family rentals? Well, we see strong demand from the tenant side. There's tenant longevity. These tenants tend to stay longer because they're not outgrowing their rental space. And we're getting access to an entirely diverse tenant pool that's very different from the multifamily tenants we typically target. Oops. So these two couple charts will back up what I mean by that. So as you can see in the last decade, we've seen 13 million more families renting. 
And to really show a difference between multifamily and single family rentals, more than 50% of single family rentals have three plus bedrooms. So you're not seeing the attrition because people can grow into their homes should family circumstances change. So I'll run through a quick SWOT analysis. What's the greatest strength in single family rentals? Well, we're seeing a high demand and the need is not yet met. A weakness is some of the property and asset management challenges that we've seen, especially with scattered site locations. One of the largest opportunities as an institutional investor is to really get in, it's still undersaturated. And finally, a big threat we've seen is still there's a taboo between renting versus owning, and we're starting to see a regulation threat. Well, there's my cue to cut right in. Thank you, Lily. You're for welcome. A positive and uplifting look into single family rental. Here I am back with some more market commentary that's going to wipe that smile right off your face, though. Let's turn on the light and reveal the boogeyman in the suburban bedroom, institutional home ownership. Once grandpa is done talking about gas prices, he's going to move right along to those big companies coming into his neighborhood, buying up all the houses and demoing his pickleball court. And Congress is starting to listen. Earlier this year, they met to discuss the implications of these intruders into the market and what to do about them. But we're here to tell you that grandpa and Congress are wrong. Institutions might be just what this industry needs. We saw them come in during the GFC, prop up the floor and deliver supply to Albert and his friends to help them get out of the basement. They have the deep pocketbooks necessary to make the capital expenditures on the ESG front, moving that subject from boardrooms into a reality. And that motivation, the thing that drives them, those, that quest for efficiency and cost savings that translates to the bottom line, is the very thing that gave birth to what made all of this possible. And that, folks, is prop tech. And now I'm going to move it on to two members of our acquisition team, Kyle and Josh, who are going to discuss our entrance into this market. Thanks, Gabby. So I'd like to introduce our investment opportunity we have today with Sidewalk Advisors. So Sidewalk is a prop tech company, like what Gabby spoke about. And really they provide the underlying technology that makes institutional ownership of these single family rentals possible at mass scale. So Sidewalk has two arms. They have an operating arm or Opto. And that's the group that has the digital technology for management of SFRs, accounting, bill payment, maintenance, trouble tickets, really the whole gamut. Now, the other side of Sidewalk is their property arm or Propto. And they source and put together bundles of single family rentals that they can then sell to outside investors. But before really diving into this investment opportunity, I do wanna answer the question, why are we even interested in purchasing or investing in an operating company as a real estate fund? And the answer is because it fits squarely in our fund objectives. Our number one fund objective is to identify and act upon long-term trends in the real estate industry. And by investing in an operating company, we can capture all of that positive momentum that there is behind single family rentals and do it in a way that doesn't require large amounts of physical assets. If the sector does well, we'll do well. Now, this will also let us diversify our revenue stream, moving to more of a fee for service model where we capture more revenue from not only our tenants, but every other tenant in the sidewalk ecosystem. So how does this investment look? Well, there's two different equity options we can pursue, but no matter what, they're looking for $20 million in exchange for 23.5% ownership of the company. Now, I do want to point out that the funding round closes at the end of this year, so we do need to act quickly if we want to get in on this investment. So what's the difference between those two forms of equity? Common equity is your basic stock investment. You get voting rights and you're a part owner of the company. The other option is a convertible preferred equity. Now, in that case, we're second in line to get paid immediately behind debt, <clears throat> and we don't get voting rights. But we do have a preferred return and an equity kicker. So if Sidewalk really knocks it out of the park, we still get to participate in that upside. But most importantly, the convertible preferred equity can be converted to common equity in the future. So we really feel it provides the best of both worlds. We do wanna pursue this uh, convertible preferred equity option, but with one change. We wanna increase our return to 10% because we feel <clears throat> that's more appropriate in today's debt markets. So how does that look uh, from a capital stack? It looks like what's shown on the right. We'd be in green immediately below the $10 million of existing debt. And by getting paid immediately after debt, we really remove a lot of the risk and volatility from this investment. Ultimately, investors don't invest in Cape May's Evergreen Residential Fund for venture-style risk and volatility. 
They want solid, steady, predictable returns, like what we can provide here with our convertible preferred equity option. Now, speaking of returns, Josh, what do the returns look like on this investment? Thanks, Kyle. So with an assumed EBITDA multiple of 6x at exit, which we felt like was appropriate after looking at comparable companies with our investment bankers, and a $20 million capital outlay over a two-year investment period, we come to a 17.5% IRR and a 1.7x multiple on invested capital. Now, I want to orient you all to the white space here. This white space represents all of the scenarios in which we don't achieve our base case assumptions and still meet our preferred return. And we felt like it was important to look at the downside risk. With growth, with growth expectations of 100% in year one, 100% in year two, and 80% in year three, we felt that there was real downside risk given the tight belt tightening we've seen tech firms undergo in the last several months. And we also look at this sensitivity in terms of the common equity investment. And while the upside here is certainly tantalizing, I want to orient you to the gray at the bottom of the screen. These boxes represent scenarios where we don't meet the goals of our fund or lose money. As a core evergreen fund that's never made a prop tech investment and is committed to capital preservation, we felt like this was too much risk. And those are, that's why the numbers led us to the preferred equity investment. Thanks, Josh. So we really like the idea of investing into Sidewalk and their operational or Opto arm. But by investing in Sidewalk, that also opens the door to Propto, their property arm. Now, if you remember, Propto is the property side of Sidewalk that puts together these bundles of single family rentals that can then be resold to outside investors. If we invest in Sidewalk, we can pursue a right of first offer on $100 million of such bundles. That's 500 plus houses, each providing a 5% annual return to our investors. That greatly increases <clears throat> our allocation into the SFR space and allows us to meet that 10% goal that Albert spoke about earlier. Now, Josh, what do the returns look like and what are some of the risks of this property level investment? Yeah, thanks, Tom. We like Propco, but there are a couple of things that management didn't address with us or that we'd like to change. And most of them have to do with the waterfall and the promote. Specifically, management requested that they get 15% of the net cash flow at exit. And we felt like that was too juicy and would like to propose 10%. Similarly, they were asking for 50% of the management fees to go straight to their pockets. And we felt like that was too much. And we want to propose 40% go to them and 60% go into Opco to give it more operating. So what does this investment look like? Again, with a two-year capital outlay of $100 million and the assumptions that I previously laid out, we achieve a 13.4% IRR and a 1.5% X equity multiple. So you've heard about both investments. Propco and Opto. And we want to do both. Committing $120 million in capital over a two-year investment period and exiting after five years. And going back to the macroeconomic tailwinds or headwinds that Gabby touched on earlier, we felt like it was a prudent idea to increase our allocation to the single-family rental markets. If we were going to make that investment, we felt like it was important to also invest in the operating company because it provided obvious synergies with a growing portfolio and allowed us to scale in a way we otherwise wouldn't be able to. So what does a combined investment look like? Again, $120 million capital outlay over a two year period and the, and the a 6X EBITDA multiple at exit, we get to a 14.2% IRR and a 1.6X equity multiple. You've heard our base case, but we are a core evergreen fund we're not a venture firm. We don't look for those returns. And we always think about the downside. So if we were to achieve 60% of the revenue growth and a 4x EBITDA multiple at exit, we would still achieve returns that are within our fund's 9 to 11% mandate. Thanks, Dean. So you're probably asking yourself, Elijah, where does that leave the portfolio? We'll take a look at this chart right at the top. This is a snapshot comparison of our portfolio before and after those investments. I'd like to call your attention to the bottom right corner. Through our investments, we're able to ride that upward momentum of single family rentals while achieving our target allocation. Now, to wrap things up, in this macroeconomic environment, our strategy is defensive, focusing on investments with strong underlying fundamentals. We also want to adjust our portfolio in the context of these macro in the context of this macroeconomic environment. And lastly, you heard from the team, we like both, and we hope you do too. So I'll leave you with this. If you can't beat them, you ought to buy into them. Thank you.
So for, um, for our fund, there's a potential for 5% in Q1 of next year, as well as another 5% of net asset value in Q2 of next year. Now we're coming to the end of the year, we've seen subscriptions come in, but no requests for redemptions yet. And so we're pretty confident. However, what we wanted to do is make sure that we provided some funds. And so what we did is, what we did is, is instead of taking 5% in Q1 and 5% in Q2 of next year, we just took 5% for the first half of the year, and that's where you get the $55 million. Um, so ultimately, as you mentioned, we want to ensure alignment of interests around the deal. And while we were looking at this deal, I think one of the bigger concerns was they don't have any skin in the game. We're coming up with all the equity and they're taking fees in various parts. So when we're talking about the promote, there's other areas that we might be open to discussion with if they were to put some capital in. Now, if they're just putting everything into the other arm and maybe they just don't have that type of capital, we wanna see something that flows up to us through Opco, which is why we adjusted the allocation. Uh, we're negotiating. Uh, we did sensitize the different levels of the promote, but really it's all about control at the end of the day, right? So however that looks like in the different negotiations in order to ensure that we have control around the buy, which we seem to have, but more specifically around the sell and the underlying asset, that's what we're overall concerned with as an evergreen fund. We want to hold on to that real estate in most cases. Um, and so our, our um, unrestricted cash balance is actually 95 million. So if another 55 million came due, we could easily pay that in cash. Now, I kind of mentioned you do want to have a healthy cash balance in the future. And so there are a few different ways where, um, where we'd be able to sell. Um, if we're looking at both the high rise and the garden apartments, um, we would actually plan to sell the high rise apartments. We really think once again, you heard, um, you heard us speak a little bit about office and the return to work being a lot slower. We kind of look in those markets where those residential patterns do not match up with or align more with the office and there's less folks inside those urban CBD cores. Um, I also do want to note that if we are talking on a portfolio wide basis, I really stress the need that we need to be defensive when it comes to our leverage. So we do have um, in our affordable housing portfolio, we have four total assets. There are three that are unencumbered and there's one um, with debt. And so we'd probably also look into selling the one um, that has the debt in order to mitigate our leverage across the portfolio. Yeah. And so for high rise, when it comes to, when it comes to inflation, um, we really believe that that is going to really drive up construction costs. So the replacement cost for those same high rises in the market is really going to increase, making it a lot, a more prudent decision in order to hold on or acquire existing assets. Now for Garden, we really think that, you know, for our portfolio, half of our strategy or 50% of these is to go in and really provide a value add strategy, paying money for renovations. And so we really think once again, if that is our main strategy in this, in this asset class, inflation is going to drive those prices up and we may not see the returns that, that we were underwriting earlier. Thank you. Thank you.